The Autobiography of Benjamin Franklin, Chapter 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Benjamin Franklin, edited by Frank Woodward Payne. Chapter 1. Ancestry and Early Youth in Boston Twyford at the Bishop of St. Asaph's, 1771 Begin footnote Twyford is a small village not far from Winchester in Hampshire, southern England. There was the county seat of the Bishop of St. Asaph, Dr. Jonathan Shipley, the good bishop as Dr. Franklin used to style him. Their relations were intimate and confidential. In his pulpit, and in the House of Lords as well as in society, the bishop always opposed the harsh measures of the crown towards the colonies. End footnote. Dear son, I have ever had pleasure in obtaining any little anecdotes of my ancestors. You may remember the inquiries I made among the remains of my relations when you were with me in England and the journey I undertook for that purpose. Imagining it may be equally agreeable to you to know the circumstances of my life, many of which you are yet unacquainted with, and expecting the enjoyment of a week's uninterrupted leisure in my present country retirement, I sit down to write them to you, for which I have besides some other inducements. Having emerged from the poverty and obscurity in which I was born, and bred, to a state of affluence and some degree of reputation in the world, and having gone so far through life with a considerable share of felicity, the conducting means I made use of, which with the blessing of God so well succeeded, my posterity may like to know, as they may find some of them suitable for their own situations, and therefore fit to be imitated. That felicity, when I reflect on it, has induced me sometimes to say, that were it offered to my choice, I would have no objection to a repetition of the same life from its beginning, only asking the advantages authors have in second edition to correct some faults of the first. So I might, besides correcting the faults, change some sinister accidents and events of it for others more favorable. But though this were denied, I should still accept the offer. Since such a reputation is not to be expected, the next thing most like living one's life over again seems to be a recollection of that life, and to make that recollection as durable as possible by putting it down in writing. Hereby, too, I shall indulge the inclination so natural in old men, to be talking of themselves and their own past actions, and I shall indulge it without being tiresome to others, who, through respect to age, might conceive themselves obliged to give me a hearing, since this may be read or not as any one pleases. And lastly, I may as well confess it, since my denial of it will be believed by nobody, perhaps I shall a good deal gratify my own vanity. Begin footnote. In this connection Woodrow Wilson says, and yet the surprising and delightful thing about this book is that, take it all in all, it has not the low tone of conceit, but is a staunch man's sober and unaffected assessment of himself and the circumstances of his career. Gibbon and Hume, the great British historians, who were contemporaries of Franklin, express in their autobiographies the same feeling about the propriety of just self-praise. End footnote. Indeed, I scarce ever heard or saw the introductory words, without vanity I may say, etc., with some vain thing immediately following. Most people dislike vanity in others, whatever share they have of it themselves, but I give it fair quarter whenever I meet with it, being persuaded that it is often productive to the good possessor, and to others that are within his sphere of action, and therefore, in many cases, it would not be altogether absurd if a man were to thank God for his vanity among the other comforts of life. And now I speak of thanking God, I desire with all humility to acknowledge that I owe 
the mentioned happiness of my past life to his kind providence which led me to the means i used and gave them success my belief of this induces me to hope though i must not presume that the same goodness will still be exercised toward me in continuing that happiness or enabling me to bear a fatal reverse which i may experience as others have done the complexion of my future fortune being known to him only in whose power it is to bless to us even our afflictions the notes one of my uncles who had the same kind of curiosity in collecting family anecdotes once put into my hands furnished me with several particulars relating to our ancestors from these notes i learned that the family had lived in the same village Ecton, in Northamptonshire, for three hundred years, and how much longer he knew not, perhaps from the time when the name of Franklin, that before was the name of an order of people, begin footnote, a small landowner, end footnote, was assumed by then as a surname, when others took surnames all over the kingdom on a freehold of about thirty acres aided by the smith's business which had continued in the family till his time the eldest son being always bred to that business a custom which he and my father followed as to their eldest sons when i searched the registers at ecton i found an account of their births marriages and burials from the year fifteen fifty five only and there being no registers kept in that parish at any time preceding by that register i perceived that i was the youngest son of the youngest son for five generations back my grandfather thomas who was born in fifteen ninety eight lived in ecton until he grew too old to follow business longer when he went to live with his son john a dyer at branbury in oxfordshire and whom my father served as an apprentice there my grandfather died and lies buried we saw his gravestone in 1758. His eldest son, Thomas, lived in the house at Ecton, and left it, with the land, to his only child, a daughter, who, with her husband, one Fisher, of Wellingborough, sold it to Mr. Isted, now lord of the manor there. My grandfather had four sons that grew up, viz. Thomas, John, Benjamin, and Josiah. I will give you what account I can of them, at this distance from my papers, and if these are not lost in my absence, you will among them find many more particulars. Thomas was bred a smith under his father, but, being ingenious and encouraged in learning, as all my brothers were, by an Esquire Palmer, then the principal gentleman in that parish, he qualified himself for the business of Scrivener, became a considerable man in the county, was a chief mover of all public-spirited undertakings for the county, or town of Northampton, and his own village, of which many instances are related of him, and which taken notice of and patronized by the then Lord Halifax. He died in 1702, January 6th, Old Style, just four years to the day before I was born. Begin footnote. January 17th new style. This change in the calendar was made in 1582 by Pope Gregory the Thirteenth, and adopted in England in 1752. Every year whose number in the common reckoning since Christ is not divisible by four, as well as every year whose number is divisible by one hundred, but not by four, shall have three hundred and sixty-five days, and all other years shall have three hundred and sixty-six days. In the eighteenth century there was a difference of eleven days between the old and new style of reckoning, which the English Parliament cancelled by making the 3rd of September, 1752, the 14th. The Julian calendar, or old style, is still retained in Russia and Greece, whose dates consequently are now thirteen days behind those of other Christian countries. End footnote. The account we received of his life and character from some old people at Ecton, I remember, struck you as something extraordinary, from its similarity to what you knew of mine. Had he died on the same day, you said, one might have supposed a transmigration. John was bred a dyer, I believe of woolens. Benjamin was bred a silk dyer, 
serving an apprenticeship at London. He was an ingenious man. I remember him well, for when I was a boy he came over to my father in Boston, and lived in the house with us some years. He lived to a great age. His grandson, Samuel Franklin, now lives in Boston. He left behind him two quattro volumes, manuscripts, of his own poetry, consisting of little occasional pieces addressed to his friends and relations, of which the following sent me is a specimen. He had formed a shorthand of his own, which he taught me, but never practised. I have now forgot it. I was named after this uncle, there being a particular affection between him and my father. He was very pious, a great attendee of sermons of the best preachers, which he took down in his shorthand, and had with him many volumes of them. He was also much of a politician, too much perhaps for his station. There fell lately into my hands in London a collection he made of all the principal pamphlets relating to public affairs from 1641 to 1717. Many of the volumes are wanting as appears by the numbering, but there still remain eight volumes in folio, and twenty-four in quattro, and in octavo. A dealer in old books met with them, and knowing me by my sometimes buying of him, he brought them to me. It seems my uncle must have left them here when he went to America, which was about fifty years since. There are many of his notes in the margins. The obscure family of ours was early in the Reformation, and continued Protestants through the reign of Queen Mary, when they were sometimes in danger of trouble on account of their zeal against popery. They had got an English Bible, and to conceal and secure it, it was fastened open with tapes under and within the cover of a joint stool. When my great-great-grandfather read it to his family, he turned up the joint stool upon his knees turning over the leaves, then under the tapes. One of the children stood at the door to give notice if he saw the apparitor coming, who was an officer of the spiritual court. In that case the stool was turned down again upon its feet, when the Bible remained concealed under it as before. This anecdote I had from my uncle Benjamin. The family continued all of the Church of England till about the end of Charles II's reign when some of the ministers had been outed for nonconformity, holding conventicles in North Hampshire, Benjamin and Joshua adhered to them, and so continued all their lives, the rest of the family remained with the Episcopal Church. Conventicles were secret gatherings of dissenters from the established church. Joshua, my father, married young, and carried his wife and three children into England, about 1682. The convecticles having been forbidden by law, and frequently disturbed, induced some considerable men of his acquaintance to remove to that country, and he was prevailed with them to accompany them thither, where they expected to enjoy their mode of religion with freedom. By the same wife he had four children more born there, and by a second wife ten more, in all seventeen, of which I remember thirteen sitting at one time at his table who all grew up to be men and women, and married. I was the youngest son, and the youngest child but two, and was born in Boston, New England. My mother, the second wife, was Abbeth Folger, daughter of Peter Folger, one of the first settlers of New England, of whom honorable mention is made by Cotton Mather. In his church history of that country, entitled Magnalia Christi Americana, as a godly, learned Englishman. If I remember the words rightly, I have heard that he wrote sundry small occasional pieces, but only one of them was printed, which I saw now many years since. It was written in 1675, in the homespun verse of that time and people, and addressed to those then concerned in the government there. It was in favor of liberty of conscience, and in behalf of the Baptists, Quakers, and other sectaries that had been under persecution, ascribing the Indian wars and other distresses that had befallen the country to that persecution, as so many judgments of God to punish so heinous an offense, and exhorting a repeal of those uncharitable laws. The whole appeared to me as written with a good deal of decent plainness and manly freedom. 
The six concluding lines I remember, though I have forgotten the two first of the stanza, but the purport of them was that his censures proceeded from goodwill, and therefore he would be known to be the author. Because to be a libeller, says he, I hate it with my heart. From Sherburn town, where now I dwell, my name I do put here. Without offense, your real friend, it is Peter Folger. Franklin was born on Sunday, January 6th, Old Style, 1706, in a house on Milk Street, opposite the Old South Meeting House, where he was baptized on the day of his birth, during a snowstorm. The house where he was born was burned in 1810. Cotton Mather, 1663 to 1728, clergyman, author, and scholar, pastor of the North Church, Boston, he took an active part in the persecution of witchcraft. My elder brothers were all apprentices to different trades. I was put to the grammar school at eight years of age, my father intending to devote me as the tithe of his sons to the service of the church. My early readiness in learning to read, which must have been very early as I do not remember when I could not read, and the opinion of all his friends that I should certainly make a good scholar, encouraged him in this purpose of his. My uncle Benjamin too approved of it, and proposed to give me all his shorthand volumes of sermons, I suppose a stock to be set up with, if I would learn his character. I continued, however, at the grammar school not quite one year, though in that time I had risen gradually from the middle of the class of that year to be the head of it, and farther was removed to the next class above it, in order to go with that into the third at the end of the year. But my father, in the meantime, from a view of the expense of a college education, which having so large a family he could not well afford, and the mean living many so educated were afterwards able to obtain, reasons that he gave to his friends in my hearing, altered his first intention, took me from the grammar school, and sent me to a school for writing and arithmetic, kept by a then famous man, Mr. George Browell very successful in his profession generally, and by mild, encouraging methods, under him I acquired fair writing pretty soon, but I failed in the arithmetic, and made no progress in it. At ten years old I was taken home to assist my father in his business, which was that of a tallow chandler and soap boiler, a business he had not bred to, but had assumed on his arrival in New England, and on finding his dying trade would not maintain his family, being in little request. Accordingly, I was employed in cutting wick for the candles, filling the dipping mold, and the molds for cast candles, attending the shop, going of errands, etc. I disliked the trade, and had a strong inclination for the sea, but my father declared against it. However, living near the water, I was much in and about it, learned early to swim well, and to manage boats, and, when in a boat or canoe with other boys, I was commonly allowed to govern, especially in any case of difficulty, and upon other occasions I was generally a leader among the boys, and sometimes led them into scrapes, of which I will mention one instance, as it shows an early projecting public spirit, though not then justly conducted. There was a salt marsh that bounded part of the mill pond, on the edge of which, at high water, we used to stand to fish for minnows. By much tramping we had made it a mere quagmire. My proposal was to build a wharf there fit for us to stand upon, and I showed my comrades a large heap of stones, which were intended for a new house near the marsh, and which would very well suit our purpose. Accordingly, in the evening, when the workmen were gone, I assembled a number of my playfellows, and working with them diligently, like so many emmets, sometimes two or three to a stone, we brought them all away and built our little wharf. The next morning the workmen were surprised at missing the stones, which were found in our wharf. Inquiry was made after the removers. We were discovered and complained of. Several of us were corrected by our fathers, and, though I pleaded the usefulness of the work, mine convinced me that nothing was useful which was not honest. I think you may like to know something of his person and character. 
he had an excellent constitution of body was of middle stature but well set and very strong he was ingenious could draw prettily was skilled a little in music and had a clear pleasing voice so that when he played psalm tunes on his violin and sung withal as he sometimes did in an evening after the business of the day was over it was extremely agreeable to hear he had a mechanical genius too and on occasion was very handy in the use of other tradesmen's tools but his great excellence lay in a sound understanding and solid judgment in prudent matters both in private and public affairs in the latter indeed he was never employed the numerous family he had to educate and the straitness of his circumstances kept him close to the, his trade but i remember well his being frequently visited by leading people who consulted him for his opinion in affairs of the town or of the church he belonged to and showed a good deal of respect for his judgment and advice he was also much consulted by private persons about their affairs when any difficulty occurred and frequently chosen an arbiter between contending parties at his table he liked to have as often as he could some sensible friend or neighbor to converse with and always took care to start some ingenious or useful topic for discourse which might tend to improve the minds of his children by this means he turned our attention to what was good just and prudent in the conduct of life and little or no notice was ever taken of what related to the victuals on the table whether it was well or ill-dressed, in or out of season, of good or bad flavor, preferable or inferior to this or that other thing of the kind. So that was how I was brought up, in such a perfect inattention to those matters as to be quite indifferent what kind of food was set before me, and so unobservant of it, that to this day, if I am asked, I can scarce tell a few hours after dinner what I dined upon this has been a convenience to me in travelling where my companions have been sometimes very unhappy for want of a suitable gratification of their more delicate because better instructed tastes and appetites my mother had likewise an excellent constitution she suckled all her ten children i never knew whether my father or mother to have any sickness but that of which they died he at eighty-nine, and she at eighty-five years of age. They lie buried together at Boston. I, some years since, placed a marble over their grave with this inscription, Josiah Franklin and Abbath his wife, lie here in turn. They lived lovingly together in wedlock fifty-five years, without an estate or any gainful employment, by constant labor and industry, with God's blessing, they maintained a large family comfortably, and brought up thirteen children and seven grandchildren reputably. From this instance, reader, be encouraged to diligence in thy calling, and distrust not providence. He was a pious and prudent man, she a discreet and virtuous woman. Their youngest son, in fifeful regard to their memory, places this stone. J. F., born 1655, died 1744, at 89. A. F., born 1667, died 1752, 85. This marble having decayed, the citizens of Boston in 1827 erected in its place a granite obelisk, 21 feet high, bearing the original inscription quoted in the text, and another explaining the erection of the monument. By my rambling digressions I perceive myself to be grown old. I used to write more methodically, but one does not dress for private company as for a public ball. Tis perhaps only negligence. To return, I continued thus employed in my father's business for two years, that is, till I was twelve years old, and my brother John, who was bred to that business, having left my father, married and set up for himself at Rhode Island there was all appearance that I was destined to supply his place and become a tallow-chandler. But my dislike to the trade continuing, my father was under apprehensions that if he did not find one for me more agreeable, I should break away and go to sea, as his son Joshua had done, to his great vexation. He therefore sometimes took me to walk with him and see joiners, bricklayers, turners, 
braziers, etc., at their work, that he might observe my inclination and endeavour to fix it on some trade or other, on land. It has ever since been a pleasure to me to see good workmen handle their tools, and it has been useful to me, having learnt so much by it, as to be able to do little jobs myself in my house, when a workman could not readily be got, and to construct little machines for my experiments, while the intention of making the experiment was fresh and warm in my mind. My father at last fixed upon the cutler's trade, and my uncle Benjamin's son Samuel, who was bred to that business in London, being about that time established in Boston, I was sent to be with him some time on liking. But his expectations of a fee with me displeased my father. I was taken home again. End of chapter 1